Good morning, One Church family. Oh, we got to try it again. Good morning. Happy Palm Sunday, everybody. Hope everybody's doing good. Uh, if you'll stand up, we'll get this started. a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to light, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide, because you're good on your promise. I'll take you at your word. The chaos fell in line. I know, cause I've seen it in my life. It's a narrow road that leads to light, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the tide is high. Could you part in the water? I'll take you at your way. church we are <laughs> thank you <laughs> james that's it good morning, oh, good morning one church good morning jordan 
Thank you. We are so glad you're here, and uh, we're so grateful that you chose this morning to be here. I know it's been a beautiful weekend, so I'm so glad you're going to spend uh, this time in God's presence, and uh, hopefully later some time outside just enjoying with your family uh, and, and really drinking in this beautiful day. Uh, we want you to know if you are new here, if you've been here a few times, a lot of times, um, and you'd like to know more, we've got these little cards in the back of your seat. So take one of those out, and if you would like, fill out some information that you're comfortable filling out, and we'd love to, uh, we'd just love to connect with you. And there's also a spot there on the back that if you've got a specific prayer request, that goes for people who are new, people who have been here a long time, we'd like to pray for uh, pray for you for that specifically. So uh, where you can put these, we've got little boxes there in the back. Fill that out and put it in and just know that uh, we are so glad you're here and uh, we are grateful for the time that you're spending here because I think it is well worth it. Appreciate you. Good morning. My name is Paul Hudson. I get to be one of the pastors here. We, we do not take for granted, like Jordan said, you'd spend time with us. Today we're going to do, uh, we're going to celebrate Palm Sunday. We observe the Lord's Supper each year. Uh, at this time, on this Sunday, we do this, and I'll explain that a little bit later, but we appreciate that we're going to get to do this together as a family. Um, when we begin service each week, we do scripture prayer. And somebody asked me the other day, why do we do that? Several years ago, uh, we actually started one church 14 years ago this month. 14 years ago this month, and we started and we said that the crux of who we want to be is make Christ followers meet needs and start churches. We've tried to live true to that. But why do we do that? We, because God's word says we should. Because God's word is our ultimate authority, our ultimate source of truth. Uh, it, God's word is what gives us life and power and strength. And so we went in about two or three years into being a church, and somebody said, hey, we ought to start service with Scripture every Sunday. I said, hey, 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 that's a pretty good idea. If we're going to say we believe in God's word. And so that's why we do scripture prayer. Sometimes scripture prayer goes right along with what we're preaching. Sometimes it goes along with one of the, uh, one of the, the songs. And then sometimes it is just what it is. But for whatever reason, we trust in the value and the truth of God's word. So would you please stand to your feet and you do scripture prayer with me. It works this way. You read the underlined portion and then I'll pray. Psalm 136 verses 1 through 3. It says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his steadfast love endures forever. You pray with me. God, we love you, and we thank you that your love does last forever and ever. That you loved us even before we knew anything. God, we thank you that you love us so much that you walk with us that you lead us to truth, and I know that there are people in this room today who are struggling. God, they, they either feel far from you or there are things going on in their marriage or in their family, in their home. God, would you just remind them in this moment right here that you love them and that your love endures forever. Lord, I pray that you would teach us today what it is to um, sit close to you. And for those that are in the room that are close I just pray that today would be a celebration. We thank you that we can trust you. We thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that if you tell us something in your word, then we can count on it to be done because that's the kind of God you are. We love you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You guys sound so good. You may be seated. So on this day, um, 2,030-something years ago, Jesus goes riding into Jerusalem. He came from Bethany, and they stop off at the Mount of Olives. Jesus tells Peter, hey, why don't you go in town? We're going to read this passage here in a second. Why don't you go in town and get this donkey? And on a Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem. And there was probably uh, roughly 100-something thousand people that lived in Jerusalem at that time. But because it was Passover, there would have been nearly 2 million people coming in and out and going back and forth. And so when the scripture read, we'll read this here in a little bit. When it says that the people lined the streets, it wasn't a few people. It wasn't the middle of a little podunk town. There were mi literally millions of people standing around. And people engaged and people joined in this because they had heard of who Jesus was. And so what you and I get to do today is that on this day when people celebrated Jesus as King, as Hosanna, as the Messiah, and then five days later, many of those same people chanted and roared, crucify him, crucify him. You and I remember the beginning and what they thought was the end. On this day, as we do the Lord's Supper, we remember that not only did Jesus come in as a king riding a donkey because that was a sign of royalty, but that he, five days later, was willing to endure the most horrific and unconscionable acts of man towards himself on my behalf, on your behalf, because he loves you. Because he desires not just to be a good man, but he, he desired, he was, he is our Savior. Because three days later, he rose again. That's the most beautiful. Next Sunday, we get to celebrate that. We get to talk through that. It's going to be like this beautiful thing. But family, this morning, can we, can we celebrate that he did that for us personally? So here's what we do in Lord's Supper. At one church, we, we invite you that if you're a Christ follower, you do not have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be a member of our church to observe the Lord's Supper. But we ask that you be a Christ follower. So what that means is that there may be some adults in the room or some children that are in here. We've purposefully chosen to do it this morning before we send the kids across the street. Because this is a teachable moment. This is a uh, more is caught than what is taught, right? And so this is an opportunity. If you have a child with you or if you're an adult that's not trusted Christ as your Savior yet, what we ask is that you simply watch. They, they, that you, you maybe consider. And parents, if you have kids, you talk with them through that. It's not, hey, when you get older, you can do this. It is when you get to a place where you trust Jesus as your personal Savior, you can do this. Because this is what it is. We take a piece of bread, and it said, and will you throw that scripture up there for me? It said in Matthew 26, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus instituted this as a reminder for you and me that every time we need a good reminding of just who you and I are. Not, 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 not what you and I are, who you and I are, to whom we belong, we do this. Paul wrote it this way. Paul, I think, met with Jesus, and throw those next passages up for me, please. He said, For I received from the Lord what, all, what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you what? You proclaim. That is what we do this morning. You and I are not proclaiming that we're the best people in the world or that we're good people. We're proclaiming that we're saved people. We're proclaiming that we have, well, that Jesus has us and we have him. 
that's what we're claiming. That's what we're claiming. There's a caveat to it, though. In part of what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he said, the only, the only challenge I have for you is that when you do this, make sure you observe the Lord's Supper with a pure heart. Make sure that things are right between you and Him. So I'm going to ask that maybe you would bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I'm not asking you to come to the front, but right where you sit, that before we do this, as a church family, that you would say everything is right between God and me, between my Heavenly Father and me. And, and I don't know if that means that you need to ask Him to forgive you for something or remove a distraction from your heart. I don't, I don't know what that is. But I know that God's desire is that before we proclaim that we are His examples, His people, we need to make sure that we are His examples, His people. So let's take a few minutes and just ask Jesus, is there anything that I need to confess to you? Jesus, is there any part of me that I've not totally surrendered to you? And then thank Him. Thank Him for this moment. Lord, we thank You that You hear us and that You forgive us and that You are so gracious. You tell us that You remove our sin as far as the east is from the west and that if we will but come to you with repentant, humble hearts, we will confess our sin, that you are faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we, we claim that this morning. We thank you that as, as often as we do this, that we this morning get to proclaim that we are yours. We love you, Jesus. And we pray this in Jesus' name. I want to ask if the leadership of the church, if you guys would come forward, if you give us a little bit of house lights, please. So here's what we're going to do. These guys are going to pass out, and if you would take a piece of bread and take one of the cups, and as you take that, um, you'll hold that, okay? When we get all that passed out, then I'll come back up here, and I'll have a quick word of prayer. You guys go ahead and start. And as when we get finished with the... Once they get everything passed out, then I'll come back up and I'll pray for us and then we'll do this. There is a gluten-free option. I know that there are several folks in our church family who have gluten allergies. And so if you have a gluten allergy, if you just raise your hand, one of these guys will bring that to you, okay? So while they're passing that out, I'm going to ask you guys, you guys sing this song with us.
And so while they're passing the last few of those out, if you're part of the worship team, if you would like to step down and go observe with your, if your spouse is not on stage, if you'd like to step down, you guys are welcome to go do that. If you'd like to step down and go do that with your spouse, that's more important to me than what's having music in the background. I'm going to ask you to pray with us. God, we thank you just for the picture of this that I once was lost, but now I'm found. I thank you that in our humanity that you have made a way, you created us in your image and that you are pleased with who we are in you so much that you made a way through Jesus. We thank you this morning for the perfect sacrifice of our King Jesus. Being all God and all man, took this upon himself. That he lived a perfect life. Sacrificed himself for us on a tree. And Jesus, three days later, you rose again. This is not a fairy tale, Father. This is not a fable. This is not a kid's story. This is not a, a good movie. This is the reality and the truth of the gospel. That you did this for us. I think there have been good people who have lived throughout history. But nobody worthy to sacrifice for us as you have. So this morning, King Jesus, we choose to remember you. We choose to remember what you've done for us. And we proclaim that you are our King. And I pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, you may eat the bread. may drink the juice. You can set that on the floor underneath your chair. God, we come to you and we thank you that you are so faithful that in the, in the hard times of life, in the times when we don't understand what's going on, that the fact that you are king and savior, that never changes. There's so much in life that we struggle with. And I thank you that as a hero and a savior, you were willing to pay the price for us. God, we love you. We could say it a thousand times over. We love you and we are grateful. So we sing praises to you and about you this morning. In Jesus' name. You stand with us one more time.
in the veil stored. What sacrifice was made as a heaven's roar. Oh, hail King Jesus. Oh, say amen. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a savior of the world. That you sent Jesus, being all God and all man, to do for us what we wouldn't and couldn't do for ourselves. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, 
All right, so we're going to dismiss the littler ones. Uh, between kindergarten and third grade, we have a thing called uh, for them called Club 252, and so they'll step out. If you did not get a handout this morning that will have message notes on it, if you'll raise your hand, somebody will bring you one. Message notes look something like this. If you did not get one of those, if you'll raise them. Raise your hand, somebody will bring you on. Uh, while the little ones are stepping out, God bless you, those of you who are helping with them. They just multiply all the time, man. They're like, like you pour water on them and they just they keep going. What's going on? We're glad though, right? That's, <coughs> that's a cool thing to see. You know that's the future leaders of our church, right? You know that? That's cool. All right, so if you're a guest, we, um, we appreciate you spending time with us. Our desire is that you enjoy being here, but greater than that, our desire is that you meet with Jesus, right? Um, we do exist to make Christ followers and meet needs and start churches, but the crux of all that is personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And so if you hear nothing else today, we want you to know that Jesus desires to have personal relationship with you and that that personal relationship with Jesus changes who you are, then changes what you do. Now, outside of that, you can try to be a good person, but good is ambiguous at best, foolhardy, and it will get you nowhere. But being godly, well, godliness will get you close to Jesus. That's it, because godliness is being close to Jesus. We're going to read the story, so I'm going to ask if you would open your Bibles well, before you open your Bibles, let's hold them high. Let's do it. It goes this way. This is God's Word. It is God's words. It is holy, complete, and inerrant. I will believe, behave, and become what it says. And in this moment, I surrender to God's power and authority. Somebody say amen. Amen, amen means? I agree. There you go. If you'll open your Bibles, uh, there are actually the truth of the, of the, triumphant, entry of, uh, the triumphant entry of Jesus is told to us in all four of the Gospels, and I gave those to you up there. I put them in your notes, but we're actually going to read this morning the one out of Luke. So I'm going to ask if you would turn to Luke chapter 19, and we'll read verses 28 through 44. And while we're turning there, can I ask you this? Who was your childhood hero? Say it out loud. Who was your childhood hero? Michael Jordan. Did you remember the commercials? Like, I'm, I'm old enough to remember, I want to be like... I want to be like Mike. The Gatorade back then, I, I looked at one of those commercials. Michael Jordan came out with this, I want to be like, well, he didn't, Gatorade. They came out with this, I want to be like Mike. They still had the glass bottles back then. They didn't even know that they weren't supposed to do that, right? They had the glass bottles. I want to be like Mike. Who else was your childhood hero? Mike Barger was your childhood. <laughs> Martha, tell him he said Mike. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Anybody else? Who was your childhood hero? Ronald Reagan, you go Tony Staley, look at that, you just elevated, right? We, do what? Colonel Steve Austin. Did you know if they're in here under 35, they're like, what is going on with Paul? What's he trying to, how many of you guys know who Colonel Steve Austin is? He was a $6 million man. He was the guy that was put together, right? And he was bionic. And then, but not to be outdone, they came out with the bionic woman. How many million dollars was she? Billions. <laughs> well, let me tell you. Uh, heroes have changed. Heroes have changed. Like, I remember when I was growing up, we had all, like, if you had a cape and a mask, you could potentially be a hero. Superman. Who else had a cape and a mask? Batman, who else had a cape? Robin, uh, Zorro. <laughs> That's... Okay, there you go. Wonder Woman, right? I tried to look up who are, apparently DC and Marvel, they had way more heroes and comic characters than I was ever introduced to as a child. I mean, they had, they had tons of them. But as you look back on that, when I was a kid, now I'm 54 years old, right? When I was a kid and we had cartoons or we had superheroes on TV, we looked at them and we realized that there was something about them that was fictitious that was not, but there was an aspect of them that we wanted to be like, whether it was their character of courage or honesty or whatever it was. And if you ask yourself, what makes a hero a hero? How do you answer that? What makes a hero a hero? You tell me. Self-sacrifice. Self do what? 
Integrity. Courage. Endurance. A fight against evil. Yeah, we have a hard time with heroes then today because we can't call anything evil. Did my ears just get red? I'll just leave that alone, right? Somebody said something over here. What would you say? Above and beyond. There you go. See, I think that what makes a hero a hero are a few core things. If you stay for D group, you guys are going to talk through Hebrews chapter 11 or the first seven verses of it. And Hebrews chapter 11 is kind of known as the heroes of faith chapter. And in the first seven verses, it details to me what a hero is. This is not in your notes. This is just free. Just throw it down for what it's worth, okay? Number one, it talks about one of the guys who was a hero of faith because he understood what the cost was going to be. He understood, and by faith, he understood. I want you to know that a real hero in life is somebody who understands what's at stake, understands the big picture. But the other thing was that a hero was somebody who was, and I even heard this, a hero is somebody who was willing to make self-sacrifice and sacrifice for the greater good, sacrifice for them personally and individually. This is why my mind is boggled. My mind, it's, it's like 90 grit sandpaper on the little knobbies of my mind, how our culture has, has elevated to idledom. Is that a word? I just made it up. Write it down. That's good. Put it in the dictionary, right? We have elevated to idledom the people who have done nothing for you and me. They have done nothing. At the, at, the, at the very least, they entertain us. Taylor Swift. She's just, right? What has that woman done for you? Absolutely, like Janet Jackson, absolutely nothing, right? How is it that we have taken people, whether they're politicians? I heard this the other day. Oh, Paul H. at OneChurchConway.com. Paul H. at OneChurchConway.com. Do you know our current president and one of the guys in, yeah, Mr. Schumer, do you know they've never had a real job? They've spent almost 100 years between the two of them telling us how we should work and give money to our country, and neither of them have ever had a real, not a paper boy, not flushing toilets, not cleaning toilets, not, not, not nothing, not making hamburgers, not, and there are almost 100 years between of them telling us how we should pay and live our lives, but they ain't never had a J-O-B. But somewhere along the way, there's a group of people in the United States who have made them to be heroes. As far as I know, they don't do nothing for us. They extract everything from, ooh, my ears just got red. All right, let's go on. I think that we have made people who just want to be different out to be heroes in our culture. We have, we have sanctified people who are willing to stand up. And I want to be different for the cause of being different. No, no, no. I no, my there. I want to be different because Jesus has called me to be different. I don't want to be different from everyone. I just want to look like Jesus. If looking like Jesus makes me look different from everybody else, I'm okay with that. The other thing about from, um, from Hebrews chapter 11 is that a real hero is willing to example for us what truth and honesty and integrity and character are. The one that he mentions for this is Enoch. And if you're not real careful, you'll just read over that. But it says that Enoch, that he was commended in front of all by God for what he had done. And basically, he lived a life of godliness. And for, he lived an example. Those are the kind of things that that we should be making heroes. Those people who do those things, who embody those characteristics, are who we should be making heroes. The last one that, that is in that first seven verses was Noah. I, I love the story of Noah, but there's something in there that, that, is so, that I internally struggle with because it took him roughly 100 years to build the ark. And you know that there were people who came in and, and on, on day one and year one, people came and said, hey, what are you doing? And it was like, I'm building an ark. And these people were like, okay, what's an ark? Because they never had all the rain before that, right? Before that, the earth had been covered by a firmament, yada, yada, right? <laughs> what are you building an ark for? What is an ark? Well, because it's going to rain. Rain, what is that? First year, not a big deal. Fourth year, mm, can you imagine year 60, year 65, year 70? You're 75, you're 80, you're 85, you're 90. Somebody's saying, hey, Noah, what are you doing? And he stuck to it. Basically, what when you read that part in verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11, it says that Noah, by faith, because of a fervent respect, for this fervent awe of who God is, it was a love. And I would tell you, as a, as a father and a husband, 
I would much rather, the, and, and as your pastor, your friend and your pastor, and in that order, I would much rather people do stuff with me and for me because they love me and not because, oh, I'm going to feel guilty about that. Guilt is a terrible motivator. And so those are the things to me that make a hero a hero. A hero a hero. One, they understand the cost. Two, they are willing, they're willing to make a sacrifice, a personal sacrifice for you. As much as I think Michael Jordan was the greatest basketball player that has ever lived, he didn't do nothing for me but entertain me. I'm not going to give my life to that. I don't even want to be like him. I want to be like Jesus. He's the one who gave his life for me and then exampled for me. And he gave it to me personally, for my life personally, and for yours personally, and then showed me how to live. But we got it all kinds of backwards in, in early group um, Rhonda said it really well. We have become a culture who no longer want heroes. We want idols. We no longer want heroes. We want idols. We want somebody who got to everything without having to do anything, and we want the same thing. It's a bunch of things. And a hero is someone who loves you, sacrifices for you, cares for you, protects you, guides you, provides for you. But what I would tell you is that Jesus is not my hero. Or not only my hero. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Savior. See, I want, I want to explain this and then we're going to read it. Let's say that you and I went fishing. Uh, Philip Moore. Philip, raise your hand. You, you and I were talking about fishing the other day. That's why you just came out. That and the light's glaring off your head. But other than that, right, okay. All right, so Philip and I are, let's say Philip and I are fishing. You're talking about being out at Woolly Hollow. Philip and I are out in the boat at Woolly Hollow and we're fishing. And Philip falls over the side. Everybody yell, oh no. <laughs> Man, you guys are so good. Follow the bouncing ball. Here we go. Philip falls over the side. And, oh, <laughs> Philip falls over the side. And so then I row, row, row your boat, right? Not so gently over to Philip. And I reach my hand out and I say, Philip, grab my, because he can't swim. Because, I don't know, can you swim, Philip? Okay, well, just for this example. Philip, can you swim? Very good. Thank you, Dara. Thank you. Dara's explaining it to him. See, this isn't, all right. So I reach out my hand. He can't swim. He's drowning. How many of you in here have ever drowned? I have. Ron Raider, right? thank you very much. I drowned when I was a little kid. They <laughs> brought me back to life. Aren't you welcome? All right, there you go. Thank you very much. All right. So Philip is drowning. He cannot, he cannot, he cannot swim. He's drowning. I reach down my hand and I pick him up. Oh, I pick him up out of the water. Man, right? P90X works for me. Okay, pick him up out of the water. Some of you got that. Pick him up out of the water. I put him in the boat. I roll back to the side. We put him on the side. He's like, man, I almost died. I almost died right there. All the people, let's say all the people on the side, all the people watching, they begin clapping. <laughs> they begin clapping. To all the people who are clapping on the side, I am a hero. Why was I a hero? Because to them, they witnessed this heroic act of Paul rowing the boat out there, reaching, putting his own life in peril, and reaching over the side of the boat, and picking Philip up into the boat, and saving his life. To all of you, I would be a hero. You're welcome. <laughs> but to Philip, I'm not a hero. To Philip, I'm his savior. See, I think churches are filled today with people who want Jesus simply to be their hero. I think churches today are filled with people who simply want Jesus to be something when they need something and someone when they need someone. But they don't want Jesus to be their Savior because Savior requires trust and faith. Let's read this together. Luke chapter 19. We're going to read verses 28 through 40-ish. If you're there, say, I am. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead, going to Jerusalem. Remember, he was at, well, when he drew near to Bethage and Bethany, at, Mount, at the mount called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say to this, say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, 
why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. See how simple that is? This is not even part of the message. This is just, this is just free. This is, right, this is good stuff. I heard last week or two weeks ago when Wyatt preached, he said, this isn't the stuff on the side of the salad bar. This is the salad. That was good, Wyatt. That was good, right? All right, notice how simple life is if we just do what Jesus tells us to do. Jesus said, hey, when you go in there, untie the colt. And when they ask, hey, what are you doing? You just tell them the Lord has need of it. So they go in, they untie the colt. Somebody says, what are you doing? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they said the Lord has need of it, verse 35, and they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. They set Jesus on it. Um, just know this, that in that time a donkey was, um, a, was a ride of royalty. I know that you and I look at that and we go, oh, it's a donkey, right? Those are like, not very good. But back then, like if you go to the Old Testament stuff, you know there were some of the prophets in them or some of the kings or some of the, those that were used. And it would say, well, they had 30 sons, and those 30 sons rode 30 donkeys. This be, that was a sign of royalty. Okay? So the reason they put Jesus on this donkey was because they were proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah. They were all saying he's king. They were all saying that he was royalty. Listen to what it says, verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the ground, and he was drawing near, already on the way down the Mount of Olives. And the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen. Now, I want you to maybe in your mind's eye picture this. If there was 100,000 people that lived in Jerusalem at that time, nearly 2 million people are flooding. So there were people, harumph, 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 people all over. They were seeing this. And those people, the disciples, when it said the disciples, it was not just the 12 apostles, but it was all those people who had been listening to Jesus. And they were all telling all these other people, man, you're not going to believe this guy named Jesus. You ought to see what he's doing. He's healing, he's healing the lame. He's, he's causing the blind to see. He is forgiving people of their sin. What did you say? He's forgiving people of their sin. They're telling them all these and. Thousands of people, I believe, line the streets because they want a glimpse of this man that they say is the Messiah. So when they come, they do what is natural for them for their royalty. They line the streets with their coats and they lay down palm branches. Listen to what they say, verse 38, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees are, oh. Pharisees, everybody go, oh, one, two, three, and the Pharisees, oh, and the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples, and he answered, I tell you that if, they, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Stop there. I want to talk through a couple of things with you about this that challenges me, that convicts me, and then that, that encourages me, that challenges me. It challenges me that there were so many people who were so quick to tell all the, everybody else about what was going on. There were these people, the disciples. They were telling all these people, and this is who Jesus is. And this is what he has done. This is what we have seen with our own eyes. This is what we experienced. We have heard him see this, say this, and we have seen him heal people. My question to you and I are, are you and I that kind of people? This challenges me. Are you and I the kind of people who tells other people, this is what God is doing? Or when somebody says, man, that is... That is phenomenal that that's going on in your life. I cannot believe that. Do you just say, well, you know, it's a quink and ink? Well, I can't believe it either. You better believe it. Do you want a God spanking? Does everybody here know what a God spanking is? Mm, if you don't, hang on. Okay, all right. A God spanking when you, well, yeah. It says four times in Scripture that God chastises those that he loves. Mm, okay. I go on. I believe that God's desire is that is, there we go. I have ADHD really bad. That's okay. All right. Um, let's go to the first thing. I surrender. Go to the first blank for me, please, Coley. Here's what he says. I believe that I surrender my life to Jesus because he is king, and I pledge my life to Jesus because he is my Savior. It's a personal thing. It's a very, very, uh, you guys know what it is like when you're in a big crowd of people and everybody starts running and everybody around them just starts running? Like, not on purpose, like, not, not like a run. Like, if you guys ever see me running, shoot the guy behind me. You know what I'm saying? Okay. No, I mean, like, um, I've been in large crowds of people before and somebody just starts doing something, whether it's chanting or cheering or running or doing, and then everybody around them starts doing the same thing. 
Well, I don't think that you and I should just follow Jesus because everybody else is. I think that I should follow Jesus because Jesus is my king. And I think you should follow Jesus because Jesus is your king. I think that I should surrender my life and pledge my life to him because he's savior. I think that what the world needs is for you and I to live like we're totally sold out for him. That we will be ambassadors. Paul said it this way in Romans, that I'm an ambassador of Christ. So let me give you the reasons. Let me give you the reasons why I think, and I'm going to put them up on the screen. Here's why I think that you and I should follow Jesus, and here's why I personally follow Jesus. Number one, because he is worthy. As my king, he's worthy. There's nobody else. Uh, there are a lot of people who are really good, a lot of heroes who have, who have done things for us. Who are some heroes of our past whether we know their names or not, but heroes of our past who have afforded us the luxuries that we have in the United States right now. Policemen, right. Firemen. Do you know that when I was growing up, the difference for us as a kid, I wanted to be a fireman. Why did I want to be a fireman? They were there for to serve others. Somewhere along the way, but I knew that like Batman and Superman, I had a Superman doll. I talked with Elise when I was a little kid. I had a Superman doll with a cape, right? And so I had a little red cape, and I would run around with Superman. But the difference was I knew that Superman wasn't real. I knew that he flew through the air. People don't fly through the air. They, they, they don't do that, right? I knew the difference. But then there's real people who made a real sacrifice. I had, had a couple of great uncles who passed away at Pearl Harbor, made a real sacrifice for our country. I've known, I, know, I, knew, I knew a man, I knew a man, he passed, who for almost a year was a slave in the Korean War. And when he sat down at church, at the very first church I served at, I was a student pastor, and he would come talk, sit down with the, the kids, and he wore the, those old jump, those blue jumper suits. You know what I'm talking about? Those blue jumper suits that had the gold buckle. You know, it's all one thing. Yeah, I, I, I could never get used to those. My granddad had them too. But anyway, right? He'd wear that and he'd come sit down. And when he would talk about how the only way they made it through, they would hang those men in excrement. They would beat them daily. They would tell them, if you would just, if you would just recant and say that you didn't believe in Jesus and that the America was, was the enemy and that you did not believe in America, that we would just kill you and put you out of your misery. And he said that they sang songs every day and they would quote scripture. They would have worship service every day. That man's my hero. That man's my hero. Not somebody who wants to be some other gender that they're not. Not somebody who claims to be something that they're not. But somebody who made a sacrifice for you and me. How did we get to the place where we went from seeing all these things that are not even real and saying, that's my idol. I think a lot of it starts at home. Moms and dads, be careful who your kids be make idols. Our only idol is King Jesus. Be careful who you make heroes. If you, if you elevate to the status of hero, those people who do not sacrifice and do not care for you and do not care for godly values or American values, you better be careful. No wonder you raised a little pagan hellion. You allowed it. Hello. So what I'm telling us is Jesus is worth my everything. He is, he is my king and because he is worthy, because he, unlike Anybody else has ever made a sacrifice. And there have been some good godly men and godly women who have made sacrifices for us. But nobody's made the sacrifice like Jesus did. As king, he's worthy. As savior, he is sufficient. That means that there's nothing else. There's nothing else. You can't earn your way to heaven. You can't be good enough. You can't get there on your own. It's not Jesus plus anything. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Because he is totally sufficient. And lastly, is that Jesus is a friend. As a friend, he is faithful. And I'll, I'll close with this. A lot of us know what it is to have somebody that is really close to us and that you can confide in and that you can just pour your heart out to, right? How is it that the same person that so often we can confide in and we love so much, they can also hurt us? 
Right? I've, I've been, Christy and I have been married for 31 years. I love that woman. She truly is. I know I tease about it, but she truly is the very best part of my life. I stand here today because of Jesus Christ and Christy Hudson. I'm telling you, right? But did you know that woman can be cantankerous? That woman can hack me off. How is that? Because we're human. Did you know that Jesus will never fail you? As a friend, he is absolutely, totally faithful. Um, as I say that, I joke about Christy. I'm a huge proponent of marriage. I believe that that's God's institution. I think marriage is the best thing that you can ever pursue. That's a, that's a godly thing. But I think that Jesus' friendship to me is even better than my friendship with my wife. If I ever put my wife in front of Jesus, we have problems. If my wife ever puts me in front of Jesus, we have problems. The only way we don't have problems is when Christy and I put Jesus first, put each other second. Doesn't that sound countercultural? Oh, and by the way, notice I didn't say anything about them little kids. They come down after that. This is freebie. This is like the croutons on the side of the salad bar. Your kids do not take precedent over your husband or your wife. There will be a time that your kids have a greater need. I understand that, right? I understand that. But your kids don't come in line of importance in front of your husband or your spouse or your wife. They come first. Mm, got real quiet. I'll close with this. Matthew 21, verse 10. I put this in your notes, I think. No, I did not. Oh, yes, I did. I put it in your notes. Matthew 21, verse 10. It said, the, and, and remember, this was noted in all four of the Gospels. We're told about the triumphant entry. In Matthew 21, it makes this statement. After it talks through and it goes through and it says that they sang, Hosanna, 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 and they laid down the palm branches and laid, they laid their cloaks down. In verse 10, it said this. The whole city was stirred up saying, Who is this? They were talking about Jesus. The people that didn't know about him, they were asking, Who is this man? Who is this Jesus? My question to you and I are, Do our lives look stirred up? Is there something about you and I, the way that we live, the way that we love Jesus? Is there something culturally different enough? Is there something in our honesty and our integrity? Is there something about who we are than what we do? Is there something different about us enough that causes people to be stirred up and go, We're at Row Reggie. What's going on there? I want to know what's going on. That's different. Or do you and I look like everyone and everything else? See, I believe that God's desire is that you and I would not only be his child, but that we would be his obedient children. It goes all the way back to notice how simple life is. When Jesus says something, I just do it. I just do it. You pray with me, please. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed. My question for us is, how do we live to those around us? Do you and I, do we talk a good game or do we live like we belong to the king? I want to give us an opportunity this morning to pray. And you may want to come to the front and may not, that's okay. But we're going to take just a couple of minutes to pray. I don't know what it is that God had in today's worship service for you. Um, I know that every time that we do the Lord's Supper, I'm genuinely and deeply moved. I don't know what it is. It might have been something during the Lord's Supper that God used to grab your attention. It might have been something that you need to be reminded that Jesus is not just a king, but he is your king. He is my king. And that he's worthy. That he's good. That he's faithful. You may be in a situation where things are undone or broken and you just need to be reminded today, just keep doing what he said. Or it might be that you're here this morning and, and you would in honesty say, hey Paul, I'm, I'm the one that's been running from God. Not running to him, but running from him. 
let us take a few minutes to pray. Now, the, the reality is you may, you may pray right where you're seated, but if you'd like to come up front and pray, we want to open that up this morning. If you'd like myself or someone else to pray over you, you just come down to the front and you stay standing. But if you'd like to pray quietly to yourself, you just come down and, and you kneel at the altar. But let's take a few minutes to pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and um, whether we heard something today that we've heard before and we just needed to hear again or whether we've heard something today that we've never heard before, God, the desire is simply to be close to you and live for you and with you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, I want to tell you about a couple of things that are coming this, uh, this week. Easter, like somebody was asking me the other day, hey, is Easter a big deal? I said, it's a big deal. Easter's like the Super Bowl for a pastor. Come on now, right? I'm going to be Tom Brady, right? I don't know. He's not my hero, right? Okay, all right. He's a pretty good football player, though. He was. He needs to stop. Anyway, I digress, right? Did Carly just come? Yeah, Carly's here. There we go. All right, so we have some things coming up. We want. Let me go all the way to next Sunday. Next Sunday is... Mm, don't sound real excited about it. I mean, it's only the biggest day in your life because had that day not happened, you'd be burning in hell. Okay, so let's try this again. Uh, next Sunday is Easter. Woo, that's what I'm talking about. So tell them, Carly, what are we doing for Easter? Oh, no, I, we're going to preach Jesus is what we're going to do Easter. How are we going to get people here? We're going to invite them. Very good. Duh. <laughs> 
No. Yeah. So we have a lot of fun ways that, that we That reminds me of that song I taught everybody. <laughs> I'm sorry. Who <laughs> is Keep going, Carly. Keep going, Carly. So we have a lot of fun ways that we're inviting people. You had the um, thing that you put in your car. Who did that? Did you put it in your car? Round of applause to you all. It sucks. Yeah, we need more of you to do that. We had some more. More of them. them, Words are hard. More of them did that because we had to have more of these printed. So whoever did that, thank Mm -hmm. you very much. Mm -hmm. But we Mm -hmm. printed some more on their back there. We have a little table with all the signs and everything back there. Yes. So the second thing was. Signs that you put them in your yard. I put both of them in my yard. I would have staked them all out. But I didn't because I want to be crazy. We want to pass them out. Yes. So who did that? Yeah. Very good. There's more back there. Grab some on your way out. Remember, guilt's a terrible motivator. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So this. Do it. (laughs) So this week we have something really fun. We have some peeps. Hold one. You can. Okay, I'll hold this one. (laughs) We have these peeps, and it says, "Come be a." Peep, oh, oh, shoot, I messed up. Come be a one church peep with me on Easter. How about them apples? How about them apples? So we have some placed around in the back. Grab some, take them with you, and we're going to chuck them right <laughs> So we had this whole conversation, and Stephanie was like, who gets to throw stuff from the stage? I was voted down. I can't believe somebody I would. I can't believe they would vote me down from... Throwing stuff, so Carly gets to. So anyway, here's what we're asking. Go ahead and throw one out there, Carly. No, I'm too embarrassed. <laughs> After all the grief they gave me this week about throwing. Okay, who wants it? Who wants it? Yeah. That's oh, now they're all gone. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge me. That is so blessing. good. That is that is so good. So what we want you to do is. Use these peeps. I know it's silly. I know it's, and, and for some of you, it's like, oh, I'm not doing the peeps, but I'll do the door hanger. Some of you are like, I'm not doing the door hanger or the peeps, but I'll do a yard sign. Some of you are, I'm not doing yard. Do something. Invite somebody. If you don't want to use any of those, I'm okay with that. But invite somebody to Easter, right? The stats tell us that 90% of people who are invited by somebody they know to go to Easter will show, to an, show up to an Easter service. And so we encourage you to invite somebody. Don't take other people from other churches. Right? But if they don't go, it's a family, a friend, a neighbor. If they don't go somewhere else, invite them to come. Here's what we're going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, let us tell you what we're going to do. What we're doing on Easter is at 845, we're going to have breakfast. And this, is, this, isn't like, this isn't like that continental breakfast that they advertise at the hotel. And then when you show up, it's like stale bagels. You know what I'm talking about? This is the real deal, Lucille. You know what I'm talking about? We have food lined up all along that side. You show up. Now, we say it starts at 845. Please do us this favor. You do you, boo. But if you show up at 930 when service is supposed to start and you ask where the biscuits and gravy are, they'd be gone. Okay? So if you want the good stuff, you're going to have to get here. Right, sis? Okay. So um, we'll do big breakfast for everybody. Come. They'll eat right where they are. We'll have extra trash cans. But we'll eat right where we are. And it'll be a great time. We'll eat at 845, and then we will do worship service at um, 930. Okay? We do not do D group on Sundays that we have Easter. Now let's back it up one day. The day before that, we're doing a little egg hunt with a handful of our closest friends. We call it the Gatling Park Egg Hunt. There are 20,000. Do what? Gatling Gatling Park. Did I say that? Gatling, 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 Gatling. We have 20,000 eggs at this Gatling Egg Hunt. And and I didn't realize this, but Carly got here right after we did the egg hunt last year. So she's never seen it. And I told her, I don't even know how to describe this to you other than controlled chaos, right? Because that's what happens. You take hundreds of little kids and you spread them all out and we'll put 20,000 eggs out. It takes us an hour and a half to do all that. And then in three minutes, they pick them all, three and a half minutes, they pick them all up. So if you would be willing to help that day, we need you to come about 930, 930 to 10 and we'll give you a job to do. If you have kids, we don't need you to do a job. You just show up and bring your kids, okay? But before we put them out on Saturday, here's the help we need we got to put those candy pieces in 20,000 pieces of eggs so that Carly and Wyatt and I are not sitting up here for hours. Right? It would be good staff bonding. It would be 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 good staff bonding. Yeah, right. 
We want to invite you to come have that fun with us. We'll do it Tuesday night, the 26th at 6 o'clock. We'll be in the student building across the street. We would love for you to show up, and whether you can give an hour or two hours, if enough people show up in two hours, we'll have it all done. Bliggity split. It'll be awesome, okay? That's what we're asking of you. If you are against egg hunts, I'm okay with that. No, I realize that some people are like, oh, I'm against egg hunt. That's why we call it an egg hunt, not an Easter egg hunt, because I don't know where you guys were raised, but I was raised on a farm, and, and rabbits don't poop out eggs, right? That just doesn't work that way. But we, this is what our culture's done, and I'm going to do whatever I can to pervade our culture and tell them about Jesus. So here's what we do. On Saturday, we all get there, and everybody shows up at 11. 99% of the people show up at 11. Or before, some people show up at 11.30, and we always save eggs for those people. Anyway, like some of you got here late. Oh, ah, just leave it alone. I just, just leave it alone. Anyway, so um, we, we, and at 11, we do this program, and we sing with the kids, and we dance, we do all this stuff, and then we share the gospel. To me, the most precious thing we get to do in the park, we share the gospel with hundreds of people. And that is what you can be praying for. Whether you go, whether you come Tuesday night, whether you show up Saturday morning, I'm asking that you pray for that, for that 15 minutes. That's the, that's the most important time as we get to share the gospel. So that's what I'm asking you to do, okay? All right, so there it is. God bless you guys. We love you all. Thank you for spending time with us. We pray that God spoke to your heart. You're dismissed. <laughs> I'm sorry.